welcome to the sportsnotebook.com's official podcast. Uh, my guest today is my old friend Mike Benheimer, and our topic is the uh, 1980s Milwaukee Brewers, or specifically the years from 1978 to 1983, uh, what we might call the, the six-pack for the town that's built around uh, Miller Brewery when the, the Brewers really uh, jumped onto the scene for the first time, and to a degree that I hope we'll both be able to convey, because we both uh, grew up in southeastern Wisconsin, Mike still lives there in the town uh, we grew up in, hope we can convey just how much they captured the heart of that, you know, the, the fans in, there in that area. So, um, Mike, it's uh, it's good to have you here. Uh, for, you know, people who may look, view this podcast in the future, we're sitting there doing this in the middle of the COVID-19 uh, you know, outbreak right now. It's the day before Easter. So, Mike, glad we can just come together and talk sports and have a little fun and some of the great memories we had back in the day. Oh, thanks for having me, Dan. This is uh, absolutely a topic that uh, I am absolutely thrilled to talk about. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, we'll start with now 1978 is the first big year. And I'm going to try to give uh, people a little bit of the landscape of the American League East that was there at the time. Uh, the New York Yankees are in the middle of what we might call a renaissance from 1964 to 1976. The Yankees had been pretty much off the radar, relatively speaking, but then they got back to the World Series in 76. They won it in 77. Uh, Reggie Jackson is playing there. Um, so basically, they're, they're the Yankees. They're, they're, they're the hated uh, pinstripes, the Bronx <laughs> Bombers. Uh, the Red Sox were the pre-2004 Red Sox. Like, they were good. They were always in the mix. And you knew they'd somehow find a way to mess it up for themselves uh, before all was said and done. Something else that can't be overlooked is the Baltimore Orioles were really good at this time. In the early part right. of the 70s, the Orioles were the gold standard of the AL East. They won it five times in six years. They continued to be a very strong contender, like, you know, consistently 90 wins or so. Great pitching. Oh, good pitching. So, yeah, that's right. So you're talking about three teams there that are setting a really high bar for everybody else to hit. And the format of the time was, first off, as a lot of you will remember, the Brewers were in the American League at this time. They did not become a National League team until 1998. And uh, each uh, league was split into two divisions of seven, and you had to win your division to get to the playoffs. And the, the frustration of that bar is going to be kind of a theme that we uh, touch on. <laughs> Uh, you know, in, in covering the six-year period. So, uh, but it was pr pretty much you had to open the season thinking minimum 95 wins to get to the playoffs. And even that in some of those these years wouldn't be good enough. So, um, so that's the landscape in the AL East. And there's also a landscape of Wisconsin sports that's very different from what a lot of people, especially younger people, <laughs> might be used to right now. And, um, you know, Mike has always been like a, a good, loyal hometowner, you know, unlike me, the trader who kind of started transferring in the mid-90s and now live out here. You know, Mike has always been loyal to the Packers, the Brewers, the Bucks, you know, Wisconsin, both sports, Marquette. So, Mike, can you try to convey to people just – frankly, how bad it was when we were growing up back in the day. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the tough part was is the Packers were terrible, right? I mean, we heard uh, probably from, from our parents and things like that growing up, obviously Lombardi Packers were absolutely fantastic, and, and they were winning all the time. But, you know, after Lombardi left, obviously the, the landscape in, in Green Bay was – terrible football teams year after year after year and the same thing happened uh you know every time they brought in a new coach I mean it was just not a, a an experience where anybody wanted to attend those games didn't want to go to Green Bay didn't want to play there um you know and then uh the same thing went for Wisconsin you know the University of Wisconsin you know they they didn't have any very great uh, football teams coming up in the 80s, and, and the same thing went for the uh, the basketball team was struggling. Um, Marquette seemed to do okay. They had a few good years there, um, obviously won a national championship. But, uh, and then, you know, of course, the Bucks with Don Nelson, they had they had probably some, some really solid years, but could never seem to, to get into the NBA finals. So it was a, it was a struggle. Uh, definitely being a sports fan in Wisconsin for for many years. That's right, yeah, because the Bucks always were running into the Larry Bird Celtics and Dr. J 76ers. And, and for people that live outside the state, you might be looking at it and thinking, well, hey, Marquette won the national championship in 1977. Just to give this some perspective, 
outside of Milwaukee, Marquette does not have a huge fan base in the state of Wisconsin. It's right. basically a Badger state. That you know, sure for those people who were Marquette fans, maybe it wasn't as bad as it was for everybody else. But like I say, that's that's a pretty tiny fraction of the overall of the overall fan base. So. Um, okay. Yeah, very much so. And I, and, and yeah, I mean, obviously the, uh, the Brewers just in the seventies, you know, obviously came into, uh, Seattle in, in 69 and, and started their first season in 70. And, and obviously they were, they were struggling. I mean, obviously back then it was a little bit different as far as who you had and who you picked up based on, you know, your team. So they, they struggled pretty mightily until, till that 78 season. That's right. So, yeah, so that's kind of the landscape that, um, you know, the Brewers are stepping into their franchise. They've not yet had a winning season in their existence. They're in a tough division. They're in an area that's, you know, starved for a real winner in sports. And um, and they make some moves in the front office. They uh, bring Harry Dalton in as the general yeah. manager, and he hires uh, George Bamberger as the manager. Bamberger had been the pitching coach for some of these great Oriole teams. You know, it's funny, as I was looking back on that, looking at the Dalton-Bamberger uh, combo, I was thinking it's almost kind of eerily prescient of when the Packers would first hire Ron Wolf, who then brings in Mike Holmgren, and that kind of starts the ball, the process rolling. So it really does begin at the top. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. And 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 Bamberger, with, with him being such a, a great pitching coach, I mean, obviously that changed the landscape of Brewers pitching. I think, you know, um, just the fact that they, they just – played um so much better and you know players came to play guys like Jim Slayton and Mike Caldwell all just uh played a, a different role uh and and much better pitchers uh when it all came down to it that's right yeah so like so Dalton you know makes some you know moves early on uh he picks up uh, Ben Ogilvy from the Detroit Tigers uh Ogilvy had been a prospect out here in Boston in the early 70s traded on to Detroit um, had been okay, but he was 28 years old and had never really done anything spectacular, but that would certainly prove to be a, a great move. Uh, sign brings in Buck Martinez, a veteran catcher. Again, it's not anything that's going to dazzle you, but it really stabilizes the catching position. And um, But the two big moves is one is a call-up and the other is a free agent signing. Uh, he calls up a young infielder named Paul Molitor that you may have heard of before. And, um, <laughs> and he's only 21 years old, plays second base coming up. And the big free agent move is he signs a 30-year-old left fielder named Larry Heisel, who immediately right. transforms the lineup. And, um, you know, Mike, like, what do you recall about uh, Heisel and him first coming and, you know, the effect that had on the team? Yeah, I mean, I think that was kind of the, you know, big pickup for the Brewers, kind of in a similar fashion. I mean, obviously not quite as huge as the impact Reggie White had, but obviously they – really turned around that offense and Larry Heisel obviously hit a lot of home runs. He was an RBI guy. He uh, was a great left fielder. Um, I, it just seemed to bring a, a different attitude, a different uh, style of play that I think made a huge difference in more people, hopefully wanting to come to Milwaukee at that point, if they were going to start bringing in more marquee players. That's, that's actually, that's a great analogy of Larry Heisel to Reggie White, piggybacking off of what we said about, uh, you know, Wolf and Holmgren. And, you know, to put some uh, numbers behind that, in 1978, Heisel hits 34 home runs. He drives in 115 yeah. runs. Uh, he finishes third in the MVP vote. A lot of years that's good enough to win it, but Jim Rice in Boston and Ron Guidry in New York are both having historically great seasons pitching and, and hitting, respectively. And um, so, yeah, and, and I think, you know, Mike, what you said, it was, it was a credibility factor. And it just lifted the entire offense. And that would be shown right out of the gate, the first three games of the season. Uh, Bamberger and Dalton's old old friends from Baltimore come in to start the year. And the Brewer offense unloads. They score 40 runs in three games. And yeah. no, you did not mishear that. 40. 4-0 <laughs> in three games. And, um, and that really just kind of kick-started everything. And suddenly, like, everybody's excited. And um, – you know, and of course, like any young team coming up, they kind of go through their ups and downs. And, you know, they're maybe a little over 500 as we move into the spring. But they're playing winning baseball for the first time. And, right. they're, and they're actually, like, lurking in contention. Now, 
you know, midsummer, the Red Sox would get really hot. This would be a year, like we won't revisit too much for my friends in New England here, but when the Red Sox would build a 14 <laughs> game lead and then collapse and the Yankees would catch them on a bucket dead run. Right. But, uh, from, the, from the standpoint of the Brewers, you know, they were, the, when, when Boston hit their peak, it was actually the Brewers, not the Yankees that were the closest to Boston. Right. They were, they were nine games out at the time. And, and something, and and Mike Caldwell is just having a fantastic year on the mound. And this baby goes to what Mike said earlier about the effect Bamberger is having on the pitching staff. Because Mike Caldwell has basically just been kind of a journeyman pitcher. He's kicked around San Diego, San Francisco, Cincinnati. Mid June of '77, he comes to Milwaukee. It's just another stop. And suddenly, 1978, he wins 22 games. He pitches 290 innings. Now, again, that's not as unusual than today. It would be unthinkable, you know. Back right. then. But it was still a good, you know, he's a, he was a horse. Uh, 236 ERA uh, finishes second in the Cy Young voting. And this really kickstarts a career for him. And something I found that was interesting, you know, as I was doing some research, you know, for our show here today, the high points of his career exactly correspond with the high points of the Brewers. Like he became good when Milwaukee was good and he faded at the end of his career after 83 when they faded. And, um, and, Mike, what do you remember most about Caldwell and watching him pitch? Well, I mean, obviously the first thing that comes to mind is, is left-handed pitching, right? I mean, left-handed pitching is always a, a great uh, great thing to have, and, and Caldwell being left-handed, um, guys like Ron Guidry, you know, guys like that were always uh, a challenge for teams. Um, so having a great left-hander like him stood out in my mind. Um, you know, he beat the Yankees a lot. We talked about uh, <laughs> him being a Yankee killer. I mean, he played when, when the Yankees and, and he started against them, uh, his record was impeccable. Um, but just the fact that he took up so many innings, he, he, that 23 complete games, I think it was, was absolutely amazing. 16 in 79. Uh, that, that's, unheard of and and obviously just a an awesome couple of seasons five six seasons where he went straight and won double digit uh victories every year so he's a big part of that pitching staff for sure that's right and you know and to a couple of your points there you know you mentioned his reliability i'm looking at over these um this stretch that we're talking about here he had uh over 30 plus starts each time, went over 200 innings each time. Now I prorated out his 1981 numbers as we'll discuss later on. That was the strike year where they only played 108 games. <laughs> yeah, right. On a pace to, to do that. So, and regarding the Yankees in this year of 1978, uh, twice he went head to head with Guidry, who I already mentioned finished second in the MVP voting, beat him twice, both times pitched shutouts. And that's against the team that would ultimately win their second straight world series. So, um, yeah, he, he could pitch and, um, and, and just getting that ace, you know, like to anchor your staff was a really big part of what the Brewers were able to do. And so now they've got some optimism going. We move into 1979 and in, in 1979, the team's actually even better. They got 93 wins in 78. They move it up to 95 in 79, but this is now where the strength of the AL East is, uh, starting to become a little bit of an issue because, um, right. The, uh, Baltimore had a great year in 79. Uh, they won 100-plus games. Uh, the Yankees had fallen. They went through a tragic season when their great catcher, Thurman Munson, died in a plane crash that August. You know, the Red Sox right. were starting to fade, and the Orioles, you know, reemerged as the, as the team to beat. But to put the difficulty of the division in perspective, on Labor Day of 1979, the Brewers are 82-56. and 56. That's the third-best record in baseball. Wow. Yeah, they're eight games out of first place. You're not even like talking about making a run at that point. And, right. you know, and they go on finish fourth best record in baseball. So we've now got two straight years of a team that's top three or four in baseball. And so obviously a playoff team by the standards of today, like in rather easily both times. And just as notable, they would have won the old AL West, both of them. <laughs> right, right. Amazing. Yeah, and, and I think that's really relevant to bring up because, like, like say if I were – I could say that same thing about, like, say the Red Sox, too, or, the, you know, the Yankees, the Orioles. Any year they didn't win, they could have won the West. Here's the difference. Those three teams are all, no question about it, Eastern teams. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like Minneapolis is the next city over in the major leagues, and they're in the AL West. So 
you know, I've often thought that maybe the most important stat to know about the Brewers in this time is the number 336 and a half miles. That's the distance from Milwaukee to Minneapolis. <laughs> yeah, right. Between, you know, whether or not you're going to, you know, win, uh, you know, whether you're going to win the division or whether you're just going to be looking up at, you know, a giant looming over you. So, yeah. So, and Mike, and that kind of goes, you know, when we talked about the Brewers in that area, sometimes we talk about like, yeah, they only made the playoffs twice. But again, like people really have to understand just how different the mindset you had in those days was like, you know, nowadays it's like a prerequisite for a good season is to make the playoffs. Back yep. then it, it was entirely different. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and that team, I mean, when you look at those teams in, in the, the, the late seventies and the early eighties was, is that, I mean, you had a, you had a lineup that started, you know, Paul Molitor, Jim Gantner, Robin Yount, Cecil Cooper, um, Gorman Thomas. I mean, all those guys, I mean, that was, that was a lineup that, uh, you know, not too many pitchers wanted to face. Um, but it just, it just never seemed to be in the, in the, uh, in the cards to get, get to those playoffs because they were difficult I mean obviously you had to play at the top of your game and you had to play well 162 games because if you didn't seem to win 100 games you probably weren't going to win the AL East that's right yeah you know and you talk about the offense that we referred to you know Gorman Thomas is another guy that's been added to the equation Brewers pick him up from Texas he hits 45 home runs in 1979 leads the American League and that kind of starts to become a beloved figure Milwaukee. We'll talk a little bit more about him later. And, um, and then in 1980, the, the winning continues, but there's, there starts to be a little bit of a regression. They're down to 86 right. wins. That's still fourth best in the American league. It's still in the playoffs by the standards of today, yep. but it wouldn't have won the AL West, you know, and I think more to the point, like there's starting to be some antsiness, like just winning now is like, okay, you know, as, as Brewer fans, we've tasted a little bit of being good. Like we want to know what it's like to, to you know, watch our team pour champagne over their head in October at some point. And um, now there still were some very definite high points in 1980. Uh, Cecil Cooper, the first baseman, hit 352. Uh, most years that's going to win a batting title. Uh, Unfortunately, George Brett made his run at 400 <laughs> that year. <laughs> yeah. Once again, everything's always in the wrong year. Caldwell could have won a Cy Young. Coop could have won a batting title. You know, it's, yeah. It's this greatness Absolutely. is always kind of looming right over the top of you. And, um, and, uh, and Ben Ogilvy uh, won the home run title that year. He tied it with Reggie Jackson. And in pretty yeah. dramatic fashion, last game of the season, it's basically, you know, meaningless wrap-up game. But he, hit, he hits a home run in the ninth inning to tie the game. So it ties the game, and it ties him with Reggie at 41 for the year. And, um, you know, Benji, as he was nicknamed by, um, you know, Mike, he's another, you know, player that, um, you know, maybe people from outside Milwaukee don't remember as much. But, boy, like, everybody in Milwaukee knew who he was. And, you know, like when you look back on him, what do you, what do you think of? Well, I mean, he was, he's great left fielder. He, he was solid out there, played great defensively as, as well as, as many left fielders. And I think he was an all-star reserve for two or three years. Um, So he was, he was always a a solid player, had some speed out there. Again, a left-handed bat. So it was Mm -hmm. always nice to have, uh, somebody there that uh, could come off uh, and 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 play the, uh, the the left side of the plate. So, yeah, and had power. I mean, I just remember him, at, like you had mentioned, is 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 being able to uh, to hit the ball out of the park and pretty solidly for uh, for a guy of his size. So he he played a, a significant role, you know, hitting 275, 280, kind of every year, year in and year out during those seasons, which was which was definitely solid. Right, yeah, and you mentioned. I'm glad you mentioned his size because for the people that don't remember him, he's just he was just, just a kind a of a guy. thin, wiry guy. Yeah, like he get that bat over his, you know, he'd get a <laughs> lean over, and it was just it was it looked violent as he was getting ready to. Uh, yes, absolutely. To take a rip at it. So yeah, <laughs> he he definitely had a, a an unorthodox stance uh, when he came to the plate, but obviously he took advantage of that with uh, with a with a vengeance, and his his power was was very welcomed obviously in a lineup that was hitting a lot of home runs. That's right. Yeah. So we go into the off season of 1980 and uh, the big issue the Brewers have is relief pitching. They're just giving up too many leads, you know, the starting pitching, it's not great, but you know, they've got Caldwell, you know, Larry Sorensen was a decent pitcher, you know, a few other guys that they can kind of move in and out. 
Um, but Bamberger is stepping down. He actually did so, I believe, like the last. Yeah, he had he had a heart attack. He had a he yes, had a heart attack right. in the off season in 1980, which I think right. caused yeah. um, caused him to miss a, a, a portion of or a good portion of 1980. So, yeah, I think part of their downslide a little bit. You know, you kind of alluded to it earlier was is that you know Bamberger was sick. He had a heart attack. I mean, it was I think mm-hmm. during spring training. Right. Yeah. So 1980 has just been kind of a star-crossed year for the Brewers, and they're looking to do something just to shake things up. You know. So Buck Rogers is now uh, the manager, and um, and and Harry Dalton goes to the winter meetings. Now I think they still have the winter meetings in baseball, but it's not nearly the deal that it was then. But uh, right. for those of us who grew up, you know, 70s, 80s, like when the GMs converged at wherever they were gonna, you know, hang out in the sun in the sun every December. <laughs> It was a significant deal. Like you went there thinking you were going to make moves. You're going to make moves. And the Brewers were going there knowing they were looking to make the big move that would get them over the hump. Now, another team in the Midwest is there thinking the same thing. Uh, Whitey Herzog has just taken over at St. Louis. And I'm going to give a little backdrop here to like the the deal he and Milwaukee are eventually going to make. But Herzog gets in there, first swings a 10-player deal with San Diego that lands Raleigh Fingers with St. Louis. Right. And um, really, you know, if you look through most of the, most of the names in the, in that trade really don't stand out all that much. I mean, some of you from the eighties might remember Terry Kennedy. He was a catcher that was in San Diego. St. Louis shipped him out, but it was a great deal for the Cardinals. They get fingers. Who's one of the great closers of the era. Uh, Literally the next day they are making a trade with the Chicago Cubs. They get Bruce Suter, who is the other (laughs) great closer of the time. Now they have two closers. (laughs) That's right. So they have two closers, and Milwaukee is shopping for bullpen help. Can we see where you know, there could be a you know uh, be, be set up to make a deal here? So um, right. So the trade is the Brewers uh, give up. Uh, what am I mean? They give up. They give up Sorensen. So they give up a uh, starting pitcher who's respectable, but nothing spectacular. They gave up a couple of minor leaguers, David Green and Dave Lapointe. Neither one of them, you know, made a long term impact. But just so people know, David Green was the prize of this deal. He was basically the guy that Whitey Herzog said, if he's not in, there's no deal. Everyone, right. everyone in baseball was sold on him. And they also gave up uh, Sixto Lascano, who was a right fielder who had had a breakout year in 77, offensively slipped a little bit, but was still, like when you think of the Brewers of the late 70s, that's a name you can kind of forget because he was traded right before the, the biggest winning is about to start. And, you know, Mike, I mean, what do you remember about Sixto? Well, he – a name like Sixto, you know, he, you was remember a fan, the name, yeah. he was, he was a fan favorite. No, I mean, obviously uh, an, another name in, in Brewers lore that, you know, guys that uh, like Gorman Thomas and Sixto Lascano guys that um, kind of were just mainstays in the, in the seventies that played good baseball day in and day out. Um, you know, a good right fielder. I think he, um, you know, he, he played well. I, I don't know exactly, you know, if he was ever going to be a, a, a superstar by any means. But, you know, again, going to the Brewers in, in the 70s, you know, again, the, the, the level of talent still kind of wasn't there. So he was kind of, uh, you know, outside of Robin Yount and then Paul Molitor coming in. I mean, he, he probably, you know, was their third or fourth best player on that team. So he, uh, you know, he was he was. I just remember his home run on opening day. I think he hit a grand slam home run back in, in 76 or 77 <laughs> was one of my fond memories of him ending the game on opening day. So he, he definitely had some stories that, uh, you know, if you're a Brewer fan, you, you appreciated his play. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I still remember being out of the game. I wish I could remember which one, but like he, he threw out a guy going first to third and so I actually had to look back at some of his record to find out if he was really a good defensive outfielder, if my memory was just playing tricks on me because I saw him do that when he was a little kid. And he did win a gold glove out there in 1979 yeah. for Milwaukee. So, um, yeah, and even though his bat has slipped for a couple of years, he's still in his mid twenties. So like, this is a significant piece that the Brewers are giving up. And it's an example of how well this particular trade worked out for them and how poorly it worked out for St. Louis. This, this obviously St. Louis as a whole did fine, but this deal did not work out for them. Sixto never panned out. He never again had another notable year, you know, in, in the major leagues. And so the, 
The Brewers have given up, so they've given up a minor league prospect that doesn't pan out, a good big big league player that doesn't pan out, another pitcher that's like you know LaPointe and LaPointe and Sorensen that are so-so and never really do anything to make you regret it. In return, they get Ted Simmons, Raleigh Fingers, and Pete Vukovic. <laughs> that's I think that's what you call taking someone to the cleaners as far as a trade goes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, to get uh, Hall of Famers and a and, uh, uh, obviously two eventual Cy Young award winners. Um, it, it's pretty amazing. Right. It's really, I mean, it's again, it's mind boggling to look back on that. And again, just as we were preparing for the, for the show and I looked at the trade and it's just like, even as much as those names are ingrained in my memory, you look at back at it and think like that can't be right. You know, it's, uh, you almost have to wonder if that Bruce Suter acquisition obviously put a, a not a whole lot of value on Raleigh fingers because to me it, right. it didn't make yeah. sense like maybe even just those two players alone Simmons and Vukovic might have been a and then another throw-in player but then to throw in Raleigh fingers I was like you know that yeah that's an that's an interesting give up I guess in in part of a trade that obviously again we we talk about is is just a hall of fame pitcher yeah, exactly. So, um, so the expectations are back rolling. And um, in fact, this trade got on the cover of Sports Illustrated uh, when it was made. It's called The Trade That Made Milwaukee Famous, a spinoff of the phrase, <laughs> The Beer That Made Milwaukee Famous. Right. So, um, by the way, for anyone, for, for younger people, too, that shows you how different the, the media climate was then that a baseball trade in December could get on the cover of the major national magazine. Like <laughs> Nowadays, you're lucky if the World Series could outstrip the NFL <laughs> in terms of right. In terms right. Of so, um, so we go into 1981, and um, the expectations are now high, and justifiably so. And um, but uh, labor uh, strife is looming over baseball, and um, and the Brewers are playing well out of the gate. Uh, they're 31 and 25. They're not tearing it up, but they're right in the mix. There's no reason to be alarmed. It's middle of June, and the players go out on strike, and they stay on strike for two months. So baseball comes back in mid-August, and they basically have an idea to regenerate interest. They basically said, we're going to take all the teams that were in first place at the strike and declare them the first half winners. And we're going to take – and every we're going to start from scratch then and just play out to determine the second half winner. And then the two winners will meet in what will be the first incarnation of what we now know as the division series. So, um, so the Yankees had been in first at the time – uh, when the strike hit and, and really Mike, I don't know, like, I don't recall any dip in optimism when we came back in like August of 1981, it was just like, okay, we're starting over. We're going to, we're going to go win the second half. Now everybody was still feeling it as a brewer fan. Hit, hit the reset button and let's go. Right. I mean, it was um, kind of an interesting way of, of continuing the season and obviously giving a, a fresh start, a fresh opportunity for, for other teams that, may have been hot at the time to just kind of jump in and now and now take over. That's right. So um, so the Brewers, uh, they play good baseball. Uh, you get down to the final week of the season. Uh, it's primarily them in Detroit that it's down to. Uh, Boston and Baltimore were lurking, but never quite could make that big push. And you get to the last weekend of the season. Uh, it's Milwaukee and Detroit. They're within a half game of each other. And lo and behold, they're going to play best of three our, our three game series in County stadium to yep. end the season. It's just two out of three winner. will go play the Yankees, you know, in the division series. So, um, yeah, that, that was exciting. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I can still kind of remember the stomach churning as you came down the stretch because, you know, again, for where the brewers are at right now, it's like the season is a failure. If they do not finish the job here and at least get into the playoffs. So like, this is, this is do or die. So, right. We come out on Friday night, and um, Moose Haas gets the ball. And, um, you know, Moose Haas is another guy that, like, everybody that grew up around the Brewers in the 80s, you like, will remember. He was kind of a number three, number four starter that always mixed in there. He had his best year in 1980, 310 ERA. And he was just, you know, Mike, what do you remember? Because the first thing I th when I think of Moose Haas is, like, just up and down. I, I don't know if your memories are any different. Yeah, I mean, you know, he – didn't have great seasons obviously again like you said two three starter something like that I mean always there was always starters much much better than he was or took more innings than he did you know he, he when he was on he could throw strikeouts I mean he could throw the ball pretty 
pretty well and strike out 10, 12 guys at a, at a, in a, in a nine inning game, which obviously you like to have. Um, but you know, he would maybe win 10, 12 games a year. So he, he never really was, uh, you know, a, a number one pitcher, but obviously he could take some innings for you when you needed that, that extra starter. That's right. And his, and his, his, his just his nickname did to this day, I don't even know what his real name is. I didn't bother to check it out. So I just, everyone remembers the nickname. I think Brian, Boos. I think Brian, oh, okay. was, All right. yeah, <laughs> Brian Moose Haas. So I think his dad nicknamed him Moose. Um, they thought he was a pretty big baby at the time. And uh, as it turned out, Moose was not a very big guy. <laughs> okay. You know, and it's interesting too, because I remember when I was in college, like uh, we hung around with this girl named Patty Haas and we started nicknaming her Moose. And it was just to shout across the bar, you'd just be shouting Moose. And <laughs> just to make sure everybody understands, like she was a real short, petite thing too. So it was, <laughs> but that's yeah. like, if you heard the last name Haas in Southeastern Wisconsin, it was Moose. That, moose. That's who you were talking about. So you, you, heard, you heard a lot of Moose uh, in the stands. That's, yeah, that's, sure. right. that's yeah, one thing got, I remember. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. And, so he, and Moose. That's yeah. Those are the ones. That's right. Yeah. So, so Moose pitches game of his life Friday night. They get an easy win. And now we just need one more victory. So now we're set beautiful October Saturday afternoon in Southeastern Wisconsin. Um, I was on my way to camp Randall for a Wisconsin game. Um, the ba- the Badgers beat Purdue 20 to 14 that day, just in case anybody's, you know, was really wondering. <laughs> But Mike has the ticket that everybody really wants these days. Yeah, he's he's off the county stadium, and Mike, Mike t- tell us a little bit about uh, that day. Uh, you know, it's it's typical what my dad would love to do if if there was an important game to go see, or if the Brewers were were playing, um, we would go to uh, a last minute choice and and uh, and go get tickets and go to the game and. And that was one of the biggest ones in Brewers history. Obviously, uh, a, a chance to to get into the playoffs, and we weren't going to miss it. So, we were down in the lower grandstand on the first base side, and uh, and watched that game quite intently, because um, obviously it was a really close game. Came down to the last, you know, the last three outs, and uh, it was a cold day, but it was a lot of fun. Yeah, that's right. Boy, Lower Grand first base side of the Little County Stadium. Those are good seats too to be able to pick them up on the you know basically the day before or day of you know. Yeah, that's, that's a that's really good. Yeah, well, you know, the County Stadium had you know in the, in those days those stadiums were just massive. So fifty, sixty thousand people at yeah, uh, at the right. stadiums. They they definitely had a a lot more tickets to choose from back then. But uh, yeah, we, we picked them up, I think the day before and just went to will call and got them. So it was, it was great. Yeah, that's right. You know, and another thing, you know, that Mike and I had in common is, you know, he mentioned, you know, his dad, they're like, you know, my dad was really into the brewers too. Uh, we always went out to, you know, several games a year. And, you know, I always remember when I just think back instinctively, it's just the, the radio always being tuned on, on to the voice of Bob. It could be a night game and he'd be in the house could be an afternoon game on the weekend. He's maybe out working on the yard and you, you hear Uke's voice, you know, coming in there. And it's, it's still amazing to me to think that like Bob Uecker is still around and it's just like, but it's almost like if you grew up in Milwaukee, like he was a part of your family, like growing up during the summer anyway, like you, you couldn't escape him. And, um, oh, for yeah. sure. For sure. Yeah, and was, you know, the games weren't always on TV like they are now. So, you know, you, you yeah. definitely listen to a lot of games on the radio. So Bob Euchre was, was always a part of that. Still That's is. right. Yeah. And, you know, and both of our dads like their generation, you know, like they, I mean, they had seen Milwaukee win because the Braves were there in the late 1950s, you know, won a world series in 1957, but it's been a long, and of course they would remember the Lombardi years too, but it's been a long time, you know, for, for guys like that. And, you know, they're, they're, they're ready for something. So, uh, for sure. but yeah, Mike and I both very fortunate to get, a, get out to Old County Stadium uh, quite a bit uh, during the days, days when we were growing up. So, and um, so, yeah, so we get to this, you know, nice Saturday afternoon in October and it's a pitcher's duel. Vukovic is on the mound. He's going against Jack Morris, the great Detroit Tigers pitcher. And um, it's one, nothing. The Brewers are down and we go into the bottom of the eighth and then, it's like the most ironic rally you could ever come up with for this team that's renowned for how hard they hit the ball all over the place. Right. Uh, Mol- Molitor draws a walk. Young puts a bunt down. That gets flubbed. So now you got first and second, nobody out. 
yep. Cooper puts a bunt down, that gets flubbed. <laughs> so we've got the bases loaded, nobody out. Uh, Ted Simmons has a productive out that drives it a run. So now we're yep. tied. And Gorman Thomas hits a sack fly. Two to one. Ball ball. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's like, it was just the softest rally. If you're you're Jack Morris, you've just got to be, like, crushed. Like, what more can I do? I've shut this lineup down, and, like, they scrape out a couple of runs against me this way. But um, so it goes to the ninth, and, you know, the Brewers have the lead in the ninth, and you know who's coming out of the bullpen at this point. Two to one lead. It's the guy who's would finish the year with 28 saves, buckle four ERA, win the Cy Young, win the MVP on top of it. You know, Mike, I'm going to take a guess that the Raleigh chants were cranking pretty hard in Cubs. There, there was, yeah, there definitely was uh, Raleigh, Raleigh. There was, there was a lot of chance for those last three outs, and uh, and man, it, just as a uh, as an 11 year old kid, that was something that you're going to remember for a long time because that stadium was loud. People were on their feet. They were all chanting in unison. And, uh, and then to get that third out and, uh, see Ted Simmons jump up into, uh, Raleigh fingers arms. That was, uh, mm-hmm. kind of a, a memory that I'll, I'll, I'll certainly never forget. That's right. Yeah. And, and just, um, you know, Raleigh Fingers for the, you know, again, some of the younger listeners who may not know who he was, like he is in the Hall of Fame right now as one of the great closers. He had pitched for the Oakland A's dynasty of the early 70s, had been a World Series MVP already in 1974. So this is a clutch pitcher, very familiar with a lot of big game spots. And yeah, and, and in 1981, especially like when he came in, it was over. Like that, that was end of the end of the discussion. Yeah, one one point. Yeah, ERA. I mean, that's that's insane. That's that's some some solid pitching. And those guys didn't pitch just one inning. I mean, yes. Raleigh typically would pitch maybe two and in maybe even three innings. Yeah, though that's something again that like it, it's it's even for us who grew up in it, it's easy to forget. But if you go back, like it was routine for a Raleigh Fingers, a Goose Gossage, a Bruce Suter to come into a game in the seventh inning, and certainly by the biggest games like this. Right. That's, yeah. So the Brewers are on their way to the playoffs. Uh, They're going to play the Yankees. The Yankees, like all the teams that had won the first half, had basically been in the tank the second half. They had nothing to play for. Um, Their only reward for winning the second half was they could get an extra home game in the division series. But, like, there was no option for them just to wipe out the division series entirely. So, it's so um, you know, Milwaukee, we're feeling great. We're hosting the first couple of games of this series. And um, we send out uh, its Moose Haas against Gidry game one. We jump out to a two nothing lead, but then the game gets away in the fourth inning. You know the Yankees, you know, step pepper away. They get four runs. Uh, Gidry takes over. I've mentioned they had Goose Gossage, who would join Raleigh and Bruce Suter. Is like those three were like the elite closers of the era. It's like whichever one was best, you could probably argue back and forth for any of them. You know, all day long, they're kind of yeah. interchangeable. And uh, and the Yankees also had a really young, hard thrower named Ron Davis. Uh, he was seen as kind of the heir apparent to Goose. He didn't quite have the mental makeup over the long haul that, you know, and didn't pan out. But in the setup role, in this, at this particular moment, he's basically unhittable. So, like, you know, you've got to beat the Yankees in six innings or they're handing it over to, to Davis in the seventh and then Gossage in the eighth and ninth. And, uh, and the Brewer Bats, frankly, just fell silent those two games in County Stadium. You know, lost uh, five to three and three to nothing. Yeah. Yeah, those were tough games. And, and guys like Ben Ogilvy and Gorman Thomas, I mean, those guys were basically, uh, they, they probably had four hits in that entire series. I mean, uh, four or five hits between the, between the two of them, obviously, for five game starters, because obviously it went five games for that. Uh, you know, for that, uh, for that championship, but yeah, it the hats off to the Yankees as far as their pitching was concerned, because they sh- shut down uh, the heart of that order um, pretty substantially and obviously couldn't score many runs. And when they did score runs, obviously the Yankees had a, had a good group of bats as well to obviously outscore Milwaukee. That's right. You know, and, you talk about the Yankees, you know, shutting down the Brewer bats. Like they kept it going, kept shutting down the Brewer offense games three and four in New York. And I guess if you would have told any of us the night of game three that the Brewer offense will still not get going, Raleigh Fingers will get hit and knocked around, and Randy Lurch is your starting pitcher. I don't know how many of us would have felt that great, but Randy Lurch threw the game of his life that night. <laughs> and they pulled, 
And then even after Fingers had given up a three to one lead, Paul Molitor hit a home run late in the game. They they win, they somehow win that game. They keep it alive. Then the next night, uh, Vukovic is on the mound. And it, it, about him, for yeah, sure. and it, that's right. And he, he pitches very well. It's a tight two to one game in the sixth. For a name that Brewer fans of that era, here's one you probably forgot: Jamie Easterly, left-hander oh. coming out of the bullpen. <laughs> Gets yeah. out of a second and third no-out jam in game four, late in that one. And then the bullpen takes it over and fingers his back, you know, on his game. They win that one two to one. So now we're back. At, it's game five. It, you know, it's it's winner take all. And uh, it's Haas and Gidry again, rematch of game one. And But it was just way too much of a, a replay of game one. I mean, again, Brewers out two nothing. Again, Yankees rally in the fourth. You know, it, it ends up they fall behind five to three. Again, we can't do anything with Gossage, who was completely unhittable this whole series. Gossage, for the record, threw six and two thirds innings against the best lineup in baseball, only gave up three hits. So, I mean, it was just, you know, they weren't doing anything with him. And the season ends there. Yeah, and I remember that last inning, and I think the, the Brewers' order, you know, for that uh, top of the ninth inning was, uh, you know, Molitor, Yount, and Cooper, and basically they retired them three straight. I mean, it was just. Uh, kind of a dominating pitching staff there they they played really well and obviously finished that game out against the top three brewer hitters and uh we just they just couldn't get it done yeah that's right and some of that probably is the experience factor too you know the yankees were a battle-tested team at that point this this would be the last yankee team to be in the world series until the joe torrey Derek jeter run began in 1996 and you know and the brewers you know they were they were getting their feet wet in October, but, um, but still as disappointing as it was, the Brewers had done what everybody really wanted them to do, which was get to the playoffs. Even it was in this weird year. And for the record, they had the best overall record in the AL East, both halves combined. Yes. And, yeah. And second best record, second or third best record in baseball. So, you know, again, they were a very worthy postseason team that year. And, you know, so we're rolling on in to the year that is dear to the heart of everyone in Milwaukee. And that is in 1982. And um, now there's going to be one notable shift in the in how the lineup works. Um, Paul Molitor has been having injury issues in these first four years of his career playing second base. They also tried him in center field, yep. um, but he just can't seem to stay healthy. He also had some personal problems. He's admitted to messing around with cocaine in this time. And um, but by 1982, by all accounts, even with the historical record, it seems like he's clean. He's you know, back on the up and up, and they're going to have him play third base. So now we have an, uh, an infield with Molitor at third, Robin Yount at short, Jimmy Gantner at second, and Cecil Cooper at first. That's a rock-solid infield you're talking about. You know, you've got Gorman out there in center field, Ogilvy's in left, uh, Ted Simmons is behind the plate, and um, Charlie Moore, who had been the catcher prior right. to uh, Simmons, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on him for one of his big moments that we're going to get to later here this season. But he goes out to right field. And so this is a feared lineup. And it's a mystery to everyone in baseball why they start out 23 and 24. They're in fifth place in the AL East. And it's frankly depressing. You know, like what's going on? The only saving grace at this point is, is that the only teams that are out to any kind of a decent start in the AL East are Detroit, who is still not quite ready for prime time. It'll be two years later that they'll really hit their peak and have their big year. And the Red Sox, whose time has passed. This Red Sox team would kind of overachieve and be a good story. But the, even they were surprising, even the Fenway faithful, with you know being out in first place early on. The Orioles aren't playing well yet, and the Yankees are in kind of a quasi, for what for them passes for a rebuild mode. So, so even though the margin is seven or eight games, there's still every reason to think you get this turned around, we can make a run at this. And Harry Dalton pulls the trigger, and he fires Buck Rogers. And he brings in Harvey Keene as the manager. Uh, Keene is the hitting coach, a uh, local boy. He's born in West Dallas, which is basically Milwaukee. It's a really nice, you know, blue collar area. I lived there for a year, you know, love the neighborhood. And I've been a player in Detroit. And um, and Keene, for the most part, just settles everything down. Like he's, um, he's one of those guys that just says, I'm not going to overthink and make this game harder than it is. Like, this is the lineup. Like I have these eight or, you know, eight guys, like this is the batting order. Go, go out and hit. Yep. And they just relax and they hit, <laughs> you know, like the, the Brewers. Oh, they ever. 
Yeah. And then, you know, they get a nickname. Like when, when this era first started, they, they called back in 78 and they started unloading on pitching staffs. They called them Bambi's Bombers. That switched over to Buck's Bombers when Buck Rogers took over. But now we have a problem with this guy with a name starting with H <laughs> taking over. But Cecil Cooper comes to the rescue. Well. And he calls them Harvey's Wallbangers. So that's kind of the yeah. name that they would they would live on live on for. Yeah, that was that was that was pretty good. They they uh that was a name that was synonymous with a with a drink, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's oh, right. It's it's some type of to this day I'm still not sure what, but it is some type of a drink. Yeah, that's right. And um yeah, and the Brewers they ripped off, you know, twenty of twenty eight for wins, got themselves back into the race you know, start to take over through the summer. We get to Labor Day. They're up three, 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 three games on Boston and three on Baltimore, who was also surging in the rearview mirror. And oh, yeah. it would be this race with Baltimore that would really, you know, define us uh, down the stretch. You know, Boston would just kind of gradually and respectfully fade away, and the Brewers and the Orioles would start going, you know, mano y mano. And, um, and Dalton, but there's still, you know, a couple of things that have to be worked out. One, we need another starting pitcher. Yep. So Dalton goes out. The trade deadline at this time is August 31st. I think it's still, I think they still have like an interleague deadline at this time, but it's act, it was actually significant and active at this sure. time. Trades actually took place. And we pick up Don Sutton, the Hall of Famer from Houston. Impossible to overstate how big this trade was, as we're going to see here. So um, then you... But now on the bad side, Raleigh Fingers has been having some arm problems. And we right. keep getting the reports that, oh, he's going to be fine. He's going to get back. We just have to have him on the sidelines. Well, little did we know he was never coming back, quite literally not for his career. I mean, he would pitch again in 83 to 84, but it's essentially the Raleigh era dies really quietly in yeah. at the end of August. So um, Yeah, that was that was tough, I mean, to, to lose Raleigh Fingers. And we didn't know. I mean – you know, it, it was a way different era back then where, you know, it just didn't seem like um, he was done for the year. We were encouraged that he was going to pitch, that even if he didn't pitch at all during the American League Championship, uh, you know, during that series, that he was going to pitch in the World Series. I mean, we we had no clue how, how bad it ended up being because then, obviously, he, he missed the entire 83 season. That's right. Yeah. No, we, we just kept waiting. He kept thinking like, well, if we can get through this, then Raleigh will be there or something right. like that. But it's just, the, the, the Raleigh never showed up. So, uh, and, and he was in his late thirties at this time too. So yeah, his career was definitely, uh, you know, on its downside. And, um, you know, one thing is we, um, you know, I talked about like the quality of the infield and a player that I wanted to talk about a little bit. Uh, this is another one, like people from outside Wisconsin, I can remember him, but everybody inside Wisconsin, well, and that's Jimmy Gantner at second base. Yep. He hit 295 in 1982. He was the number nine hitter on that team. Yes. And, um, you know, I guess, well, Mike, before I tell you what I think of Jimmy Gann, I'm going to turn it over to you. Like, what do you remember when you think of him as a ball player? Well, you know, his, his, we have a lot of nicknames in baseball in the eighties and Gumby was, uh, was, That's his, right. yeah. was, was his nickname. So I first remember him being, uh, him being Gumby, but, uh, no, you know, obviously a solid, uh, second baseman defensively wise he was um man he he turned a lot of double plays with Robin Yount so you know little known fact is is that yeah he was you know he was the yin and the yang for for years at that second base position against a proverbial all-star and hall of famer um but but he certainly was a big part of that uh that tandem there and uh you know, again, probably hit uh, 275, 280 consistently. Um, not a big power hitter. I mean, he was not a power hitter at all. Um, but he did throw right and bat left. So another left-hander, um, you know, at the plate, which was a, a nice option that the Brewers had from, from him uh, batting at the, the bottom of the order. That's right. Oh, and your, your memory on his batting average is spot on. He was a career 274 hitter. So, yeah, that's um... – <laughs> Perfect. And you know, to me, when I think of Gantner, I just think of a guy of like, I wish the Brewers had done more to honor him post-career. Because yes. like, to me, he's the kind of guy like Team Hall of Fames exists for players like this. You don't need to worry about a Robin Yount or a Paul Molitor. They have Cooper's talent for guys like that. Sure. But like a Jimmy Gantner who's like, you know, he was, um, he was born in Fond du Lac, which is, you know, right there in the middle of the state of Wisconsin. 
He went to college at UW Oshkosh, where Mike's two daughters uh, have gone, you know, and played his entire career uh, with the Brewers until the early 90s, and just a classic heart and soul player. And um, you know, maybe retiring his number might be over the top, but like put something up in, you know, in what's now Miller Park and, you know, to kind of commemorate his career or something like that. Cause he really, he epitomized that team. He was blue collar. He was hardworking and, and the people of Milwaukee loved him. Yeah. He was around for a long time. I mean, he was, he was there. I'd, I'd, I'd venture what 12 or 13 seasons, probably somewhere in there, but yeah, you know, it, it's kind of tough because for Gantner, you know, he played again, that, that infield that, you know, Molitor, Yount and Cooper, um, you know, he kind of became that fourth guy and, and just played a solid second base, but uh, he certainly uh, deserves a lot of credit for, for Milwaukee's success. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so we come down the stretch in 1982, again, as I mentioned, Boston fades, it's now Milwaukee and Baltimore, and we get to the last about 10 games and they're going to play each other seven times in this stretch. And the Brewers are in control of the race. It's not over by any stretch, but they've kind of got them at arm's length. And, you know, in that three, four game, you know, mode, um, Baltimore comes into Milwaukee on the second to last weekend of the season, three game series. Uh, Robin Yount comes up. The MVP chants are uh, rolling right. to the stadium and everything. You know, Yount, of course, will we'll give away the end. He did win the MVP this year. One of two times he would do it in his career. Yep. And he hits a home run to dead center, and the Brewers blow out Baltimore in the opening game. But it, and that's you know, and it almost felt so good. It felt almost to me anyway. I can still remember. It felt like the race was over. But then Baltimore yes. won Saturday and won Sunday. Not nearly as spectacular, but it was again. It was those damn Orioles and their pitching. Like they could just find. You know, they just kept grinding it out. So yep. Go into the last week. You know, we're still. You know, like odds are we're we're probably going to win. We're you know a couple of games up. Uh, go into Fenway, uh, win two out of three there, including the big game. Ned Yost, a future manager of the Brewers, uh, hit a game uh, tie-breaking three-run homer over the Green Monster late in one of those games. Yep. You know, so huge hit. And we get to the last weekend of the season. The Brewers are – it's in Baltimore. The Brewers are three games up. There is four to play. So translation, lot, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. In fact, uh, Gorman Thomas even recalls the mindset of the Brewers flying out. They're like, "Oh yeah, we'll pick one up out here, no problem." You know, right. so uh, now of course they would, but a considerable amount of uh, tension would involve uh, getting that because um, you know Old Memorial Stadium in Baltimore is just going insane. Earl Weaver, the great manager of the Orioles, has already announced he's retiring at the end of the year. So like the place is just bonkers, and so like. And the Oriole fans have literally brought their brooms out to the stadium chanting for the sweep. And it's yes. just this very electric postseason style atmosphere. And, um, and for three games, the Orioles simply unloaded on the Brewers. It was utterly ugly. The three games, the combined final score was uh, 26 to 7. That includes them blasting Vukovic and Caldwell. So right. they're knocking around the side. Young Award winner, they're knocking around our ace. And now suddenly it's Sunday and we're down last game of the year. They're dead even. And, um, and so to put in perspective how unusual this is, this kind of a showdown, it's only happened one other time in baseball history that a pennant race came down to one game and those two teams playing each other head to head in the regular season. Obviously we've had one game playoffs, but for it to yeah. work out to get a one-on-one -on -one showdown, and right. it's hard to get much juicier than this because we're sending Sutton to the mound, you know, future Hall of Famer. Hall of Famers. Orioles are sending Jim Palmer to the mound, future Hall of Famer. And we should say it's already known. These guys are veterans. We already know they're going to the Hall of Fame at the time they take the mound. Oh, yeah. It's not like we're looking back in retrospect. It's, this is as good as it gets. You know, I mean, ABC's uh, on the call. Keith Jackson is there. Uh, Howard Cosell is even there. He's, you know, condescending to do a game of something not involving New York for Monday Night Football. <laughs> so this is this is a pretty big freaking deal. Yeah. And um, now's the time, you know, we get to talk about the player that just defines really this entire franchise, and that's Robin Yount, because this is his day. And um, you know, so, Mike, I'll, I'll let you take the lead, uh, talk about Robin in general, talk about this particular game, anything that comes to your mind when you think of this great player. Well, I mean, obviously, uh, appropriately named and, and still sometimes looks like a kid. I mean, obviously, Euchre yeah, nicknamed him the kid, right? So, um, you know, he had been the face of Brewers baseball um, 
since uh, the mid 70s, 74, I think he came up into the league. So obviously this was eight years later, a lot of experience, um, you know, was 19 years old when he came up. Mm-hmm. So uh, just a solid 300 hitter was always hitting 20, 30 home runs, plenty of RBIs, could steal bases, was a, a, a gold glove shortstop. So obviously he was the face of the Brewers. And so for him to to play the type of game that he played in this 162nd game was absolutely incredible. Um, the the reason why he won MVP that year, because he, he was such a, a clutch player. And uh, it was exciting to watch that game because he, uh, I think, had two home runs that day. Yep. And uh, it, it couldn't have been more appropriate. I mean, it was, he was, the face of the Brewers and and he was going to help them uh, to win the American League East. That's right. I mean, like we can give you the numbers, two home runs. He also hit a triple in there, which I, you know, I can almost forget because the two homers, you know, like stood out, but what can't be understated is he comes up against Palmer in the first inning and he goes the other way for a home run. And this is like the first good news we've seen all weekend. It's just like that moment where you exhale a little bit. And I've got to think the same kind of thing happens in the Brewer uh, dugout a little bit too and then and Don Sutton who has just been so clutch for the Brewers is just pitching great baseball you know Palmer is just you know he's not bad but he doesn't really have his great stuff and you know we're up five to two in the eighth inning uh, and then but the Orioles are going to make one last push they load up the bases there's a couple outs and um, I wanted to mention this earlier when you were talking about Ben Ogilvy's defense but it's going to completely vindicate what you were saying there about what a good defensive left fielder he was uh the Orioles Joe Nolan left-handed hitter hits this lacing line drive into the corner this is at minimum going to score two runs maybe it's even going to tie the game that Ogilvy makes this sliding catch and the 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 stands at Old Memorial Stadium were just right on the field and Ogilvy's legs literally slid up the wall he was so close I mean it was a spectacular catch by any stretch of the imagination and it saved the game and then we score five in the top of the ninth, blow it open. And it's blow it open. Party. Yeah. Yeah. That was an iconic catch as well. Yeah. Just, I, I vividly remember him sliding. Yeah. And making that catch. It was pretty incredible. Yeah, that's right. Just absolutely unreal. So, you know, it's, and, and th- this was really one of the great sports moments, you know, too. In fact, I should have had my book with me here to, to highlight it because I talk about it, but the name of the book is Great 1980s Sports Moments, and you can get it on Amazon, electronic pr- print or, uh, or audio. And, um, and we talk about, you know, this game and because the Oriole fans were just so classy. They gave a huge ovation both to the Brewers and to Earl Weaver. It called them out of the dugout. Right. And Harvey Keene came out of the dugout, and he and Weaver are seen hugging at the plate with each other. It was just – is really it's just an amazing sports moment uh, on every level, and um, and for us in Milwaukee, you know, we're we're on our way to the American League Championship Series. Finally, <laughs> that's right. Finally, that's right. <laughs> and um, our opponent is going to be the California Angels. Uh, we can't seem to escape Reggie Jackson. You know, he left New York in free agency, and after 1981, signed in California. Mike, I'm sure you remember this. Everyone used to chant Reggie sucks over and over again whenever he came to the plate in, yes. uh, in County yes. Stadium. Yeah, that's right. Well, there so, was a um, famous there was a famous fight between him. You know, we, we were talking about Mike Caldwell. There was a famous fight between him and, and Reggie Jackson at oh, really? the pitcher's mound where Mike Cal, uh, Reggie Jackson charged the mound with his bat and, uh, and came at Caldwell. I, I just remember that vividly. That was kind of a picture in my mind is Reggie and, and Mike Caldwell had some pretty epic uh, uh, meetings at the, at the plate and at the pitcher's mound. So I think they were yeah. respectfully, they, they didn't like each other, but yeah, I, again, <laughs> the Yankee killer, uh, Mike Caldwell, but yeah, it, Reggie, Reggie did not like Mike Caldwell. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Right, and, and and like most American League cities outside of New York, we didn't much like. And we didn't like it. So, right, yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. <laughs> but so we start the ALCS. It starts out in California. Uh, the ALCS, the all LC, the LCS in general, is best of five at this time. The format is you play two games at one team's place, then come back and play three at the other, and they determine it by rotation. So even though the Brewers have the best record in baseball, they're not going to open at home you know, for this, they will get three out of five 
at home in the end, which right. does prove to be important. But um, well, we go out to California. Uh, again, we just don't seem to like getting off to good starts at anything. Um, you yeah. know, drop the first couple of games out there. Really, they're not particularly competitive. Uh, Vukovic and Caldwell just, you know, don't pitch all that well. It's Vukovic game one, Caldwell game two. Uh, Vukovic was a mess. And then and Caldwell's like just got off to a slow start and, and then the bats kind of never turned around. So it's, so now it's time for game three. They're coming back to Milwaukee for the weekend. And um, now Milwaukee's the one, the, the fan base that's breaking out the brooms and chanting for the sweep. It's all on the line. Got to do three in a row. Um, no team in the L- in LCS history has ever won three, in a, has ever lost two and then come back to win three. So um, right. you know, the odds are against us. And um, now the first clutch performance this weekend, though, is um, it comes from my mom. I'm going to give her the big shout out here. I know she's going to be listening to this here eventually. But uh, she notices that tickets are still available. Like, you know, they're in the very back row, you know, of, uh, you know, on the first base side. But she comes up with three, and I call up Mike and tell him, and we're on our way for a Friday afternoon uh, start. So, uh, so Donna, shout out to you on that one there for, 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 deli- <laughs> for delivering that. So uh, I can't remember if we had to go to school that day because there was always like a teacher's conference on some weekend in Friday in October. The story's even better if we skipped out of school too along with uh, that. I Hope believe, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's hard for me to remember exactly how we got out of that. I, I just do know that, yeah, it was a Friday afternoon and, and you and I went and it was midday. So either we got out after lunch or something like that, but we did not attend school and, uh, and went to that game. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And, and Don Sutton's got the ball and he comes through uh, the Brewers. Um, they win the game pretty comfortably and it's a five to three final but they're up five nothing early and Sutton's in complete command gets a little interested in the eighth Bob Boone hits a leadoff home run that really wasn't a home run Uh, a fan reached out over the stands pulled it out of Ogilvy's glove Uh, there's no truth to the rumor that Steve Bartman you know drove north to Milwaukee at this point everybody leave him alone poor guy's been through enough um but um, so that gets the Angels on the board. Then they get a couple of runs. They got a guy on base. And uh, so it's five to three, and we don't have Raleigh in the bullpen anymore. And, um, you know, Pete Ladd, this, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to call him a flamethrower, but he was reasonably you know, hard thrower, was a young guy that was inheriting the closer's role. But he comes on, and he does finish the job. And we win five to three. Um, then we go out for game four. Um, Moose Haas is on the mound for this one. And... This can be called basically the Mark Brohard game. This is another yeah. name that a lot of Milwaukeeans may have forgotten. But uh, you know, like he wasn't a regular, but uh, Tommy John, a left-handed pitcher, was on the mound. So Brohard, a, left, a right-handed hitter, is in the lineup, and he's playing left field. Uh, I'm out there with my dad and my uncle. You know, for this one, we're sitting like way up in the left field, uh, you know, seat, not the bleachers, but like upper deck, way down the left field line. You know, and it's kind of a miserable, great Ray rainy gray day and yeah. um but it's not gray for Brohard. um you know it has three hits uh score three rbis i think he scored four runs and um and he delivers the coup de gras with a two-run homer in the ninth that breaks open a game where we were ahead seven to five or i should say that was in the eighth inning and um and we win it nine to five so here we are again. We, it's literally one week after the um, the Baltimore game, and it's another you know winner take all game. And um, you know, I was in um, you know we were just packed in, in our living room in front of the TV set. Mike, uh, you, you've got to recall where you and your family were for that game. Same thing. Same thing. We were we were sitting in our living room uh, watching the game very intently, knowing that this was winner take all. It was a little bit reminiscent of. You know, obviously the '81 series against the Yankees, where obviously you you go down, you you win the next two, um, you know, you're you're right back in it again. But boy, it's going to be a, a nail biter, that's for sure. You can't take anything for granted. That's right. Yeah. And um, now this game, I know, has been shown as as part of you know, with us all holed up in these time that we're at the point we're filming this in COVID nineteen has been shown on either MLB Network or ESPN because I got a text from a mutual friend of ours from from Steve recently saying that he had watched that game. And and even he said, like, wow, were the fans just going crazy the whole time? You know, because yep. this was a tense, very taut ball game that um, 
we had Vukovic on the mound. And, you know, like when I rewatched it, I was kind of like, okay, this reminds me why Vukovic drove me so crazy when I was a kid all the time. Because like, he's just, <laughs> he, he must have given up like nine hits or so in the first five innings. He's just, I mean, they're all singles. Like he just, he works his way into trouble. He works his way out. But um, well, we're still yeah. uh, down three to two. Now this could have been worse. But um, one big moment comes, it would have been in the sixth inning, uh, Reggie Jackson was on first base. There's a single to right field, and Reggie tries to go first to third. Now, yes. for all of Reggie's qualities in his Hall of Fame career, his speed was really not paramount among them. And he's challenging Charlie Moore, a former catcher out in right field. And, um, you know, Mike, tell us what you remember about Charlie Moore as the prelude to this, to this play here. Well, I mean, obviously, Charlie Moore started out as a catcher. I mean, the story there is is that he was kind of the preemptive catcher for, for many years in, in Milwaukee until, obviously, Ted Simmons came on board, and, and then uh, they needed to find a place for Charlie Moore because, well, I mean, he could still hit. He could still play. He had a great arm. Um, so they had to figure out exactly how they were going to utilize him better, and uh right field was open because Sixto Lascano was gone. So, you know, I believe that was kind of the decision into thinking that you've got a proverbial all-star catcher uh, in Ted Simmons and you're going to put him back there. And uh, you still want the the defensive prowess of Charlie Moore. And, and obviously leading up to this, I mean, he had, he had thrown out a few people uh, during the season as well. So kind of knew he had a decent arm uh, to begin with. And, um, obviously this was probably his biggest, uh, put out from, uh, from perspective in right field. Yep. That's right. Throws out Reggie on the base paths and, and yeah. And Charlie Moore got another player that kind of slides under the historical radar, but like in the three years leading up to this, like he was a good hitter. He hit right around 300 and yep. didn't have power, but, um, he certainly didn't need it in this lineup. And even though he didn't have a great offensive year in 82, again, you didn't need it when you could play. I mean, they just needed somebody that would take the spot every day, give him some good defense. And in this biggest of moments, he, he makes the play with his arm. It's still a one-run game. We get into the bottom of the seventh. Brewers load the bases, two outs. It is about as tense as you can get. And a player that I know we both love, and I think pretty much everyone in Milwaukee from that day loves, Cecil Cooper is coming to the plate. And Mike, tell us a little bit about Coop. Well, obviously, his iconic stance. I mean, who doesn't love <laughs> Cecil Cooper? I I practice his stance in the backyard with with a baseball bat. Even if I wasn't left-handed, I certainly enjoyed uh, the fact that he came up there and kind of that Rod Carew, um, Eddie Murray type stance. But he was, I think, even lower than them. Sometimes I felt like it was. Uh, you you definitely knew who Cecil Cooper was uh, from an aspect of how he stood at the plate. Um, same thing with with Coop was he a perennial all star hit well over three hundred for many years mm -hmm. um, had well, had power fifty two in nineteen eighty yeah yeah had power in his bat um, and and just a great first baseman I mean the guy could stretch uh, you know an, an out at first base like I've rarely seen first baseman. I mean, obviously now it's a little bit different, but, but he was that guy who could almost do the splits at first base. Yeah. To, he was to so get a put out. I mean, yeah. Right. That's, yeah. So I, I just remember him as uh, his, his, his stance at the plate and obviously, uh, and, and his, his ability to play first base was pretty incredible. That's right. And we should note, like, you know, we won't do a, you know, complete comparison of him to Ted Simmons, but I'll just invite anybody to go on to baseballreference.com and compare Cooper's career numbers to Ted Simmons. Now, Ted Simmons just went into the Hall of Fame. Now, whether you think that should have been the case, I know that's kind of a divisive issue among hardcore baseball people. But I'll say this, Cooper is not that different from Ted Simmons. And my own recollections are that Cooper was so good defensively, he also, he did, he won a gold glove at a time when winning a gold glove at that position was not easy because Eddie Murray, a Hall of Famer, was messing around in there at the same time. But look, if, if you think Ted Simmons should have been in the Hall of Fame, give Coop a look and, and give him some thoughts. Just a great ball player. And like Mike said, the stance is just, you know, you, you can't, I'd have to stand up here in the office to try to admit that, you know, do it that I'm not going to make a fool of myself. But every time he walked up, he just had this look of like, he's going to get a hit. You, it didn't right. matter if he'd been over for his previous 10, you felt like he was going to get a hit. You know, and um, and now, uh, but one thing he hasn't done in this ALCS so far is get hits. He's having a rough go of it here for four and two thirds of a game. 
And, um, but all is about to be uh, forgiven. You know, like he's facing Luis Sanchez, a hard throwing uh, reliever for the Angels. And Coop, uh, he used the whole field very well. And he does that right here. He hits a line drive into uh, left field. And the ball has this effect where it kind of hangs just a little bit. And Cooper's like worried it's going to hang just long enough for the left fielder, Brian Downing, to make a running catch on it. And you can see him like he's literally pushing down, like, get down, yeah. get down. And then and it, and it drops in and two runs score and they're ahead four to three. And, um, you know, this um this uh, moment of Cooper like pushing it down, I really think I mean that has to get a place somewhere along the line with Carlton Fisk waving his ball fair in the World Series. You know, given you that- you you said it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's kind of one of those iconic moments where you're willing the ball somehow to just make it fair foul or or get down, and and that was uh, you beat me to it. That that definitely was one that would stand out in my in my head is the Carlton Fisk slash Cecil Cooper moment. That's right, yeah. So now there's still some, you know, nervous moments here coming down the stretch the last couple innings. It's only a one-run game. Again, you know, we're, we're going to Pete Ladd, not Raleigh Fingers in the bullpen here. Um, a defensive substitution in center field, Marshall Edwards, pays off. He makes a leaping catch at the wall. Um, it wouldn't have been a home run. He didn't, he didn't rob a home run, but it could easily have been a double and got something going. So putting Edwards in for Gorman defensively, great move yep. by Keen that pays immediate dividends. And then in the ninth inning, uh, the Angels get a guy over to, you know, they get a lead, I believe it was a leadoff single. They bumped him up. It's two outs. And, of course, Rod Carew is coming up to the plate. Uh, one of the greatest pure contact hitters, you know, of the era. Uh, pretty much the last guy you want to see when a single will, will tie up the ball game. And our bullpen isn't that good. Right. And um, I'm actually kind of surprised that maybe we didn't walk him in that situation, but all that would have led into the meat of the Angels order, and you're putting the winning run on base then. So I kind of get why they didn't. But um, Carew, to his credit, he hit the ball hard, but it was our year. It went goes directly at Robin Young. It's a very sharp grounder, just scoops over to Coop, ball game. And I'm like, what, what was going on in your living room right around that point when, when Coop makes the play over at first base to wrap it up? Oh, it was uh, it was certainly pandemonium in our living room. I mean, obviously, for the first time, we were going to the World Series, and uh, there are a lot of tense moments. You know, that that was a close game. Obviously, the Brewers coming back in that game, a couple of key hits. Um, like you mentioned, the catch um, by Marshall Edwards in center field. Obviously, the close uh, closeness of that ball going pretty close like that Ben Ogilvy game uh, catch in game three you were hoping that obviously a fan wasn't going to interfere with it um, we had those mm-hmm. things in our mind and uh, and for Cooper and Yao to be a part of that final play was was pretty incredible yeah that's right and then so. the fans and then the fans just streaming out onto the field I, that's one thing you know that certainly isn't going to happen much in in sports anymore maybe in college basketball or maybe college football but is the fact that the fans just uh, absolutely uh, went crazy at County Stadium and uh, and filled that that field. Oh yeah, they were absolutely flooded. And yeah, that's another thing that if you didn't grow up in that era, you probably can't even picture it because there's they get the security out there immediately now. And um, but yeah, it was just this flood of people like were were on the field. So um, yeah, just you know, just a big party in Milwaukee the whole time and. We're on our way to the World Series, and ironically, it's the team we made the big trade with, you know, a couple of years ago, the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, They're waiting. Even though that trade didn't work out, um, they made another deal following 1981. They picked up Ozzie Smith to play shortstop, so I think that worked out pretty well for them, getting the future Hall of Famer to anchor it. And and it's just such a perfect matchup because it's a complete contrast in styles. The Cardinals, like their leading home run hitter is George Henrik, who hit, I want to say, 20 or 21 that year which would yeah. put them around sixth of the Brewer power pecking order. But the Cardinals run like crazy. They've got all these jackrabbits on the bases, and they hit the ball into the alleys. So it's like it's this power versus speed confrontation. And um, I- I'm going to show a little bitterness here of saying that this is the kind of series where home field advantage would be a really big deal because St. Louis played, which stadium was artificial turf on that time, and they used it really well. Like They right. chop the ball, get that high bounce get on base and then kind of start playing pinball when they got there. It would have been nice to be able to get four out of seven in Milwaukee as, as we would today with the best record in, uh, in baseball. 
Yep. And, um, but at that time, it was the National League's year to host, so we, we go to St. Louis to open it up. And at least for, the, for, for a, a game and a half or so, it doesn't look like it's going to matter because the Brewers come out just firing oh. on all cylinders in game one. And, um, you know, we haven't really talked about Paul Molitor yet, but this is the night to talk about him because he goes five for five. That's still a World Series record to this day. And, um, you know, Mike Molitor is just so identified, you know, even though he goes on to play in Toronto at the end of his career, manages Minnesota, still very much a Brewer icon. And, you know, what do you, what do you remember about Paulie? Well, again, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, he came into the league as a shortstop. Um, he actually played uh, when Robin Yount was hurt. So, you That's know, right. it was kind of an, inter- yeah. an interesting a little piece of information. And then, of course, they moved him over to second base and then and then finally uh, ended up at, at third base. But, um, yeah, you know, the tough part about Paul Molitor was, as you mentioned it earlier, is, is that he always wasn't the healthiest, um, mm-hmm. whether it was personal issues or, or whatever was going on with Paul Molitor. But, but obviously, he stole a lot of bases. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had a lot of doubles. He, uh, he could hit for power. Obviously, he hit for average. Um, had, had, had a great hitting streak, uh, much later on in his career, but obviously he, uh, he was called the igniter and, uh, mm-hmm. man, he could, he could, he could will rallies, uh, pretty easily by the fact that he was, uh, you know, kind of had that little bit of Charlie hustle in him, a little Pete Rose, yeah, you know, he, That's he, a good he, comparison. Yeah. he really ran all full out whenever he had an opportunity to, to get on base. So it was always fun to watch him play. That's right. And yeah, and to your point about power, he hits 19 home runs in 1982. So that's your leadoff hitter. And so like we talk about all this power in the middle of the Brewers lineup, and we've got the number nine guy, Gantner, hitting almost 300. And we've got the leadoff guy hitting almost 20 home runs. You know, there's just – there's nowhere to go if you're an opposing pitcher. And um, and the Brewers win that opening game 10 to nothing. Robin Yount also had four hits. Caldwell was brilliant. Complete game shutout. And we're turning the ball over to Sutton, who's been basically unhittable in really ever yep. since coming over to the Brewers. And certainly the bigger the game, you know, the, the better he is. And we stake him to a 3 nothing lead. And, and frankly, the series is over. You know, I mean, I didn't think that at the time, you know, you wouldn't. But it's like if, if I were watching two teams that I wasn't invested in and the road team blew them out the first game and then jumped out 3 nothing the second game with a Hall of Famer on the mound, I'm thinking this sucker's over, you know. It's, right. But um, but the cards start chipping away at Sutton. They start getting to him, and 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 the brew and the card they're able to tie the game up in the sixth. And this is really the game more than any where the lack of rally fingers really shows up because they pulled even in the sixth. And that's the point that, as we mentioned, it would not have been unusual to bring a closer in in the sixth, even if you didn't right. finish the game to go six, seven, eight, or something, and and get you through with that with a four three lead. And certainly you would have brought him in in the eighth inning of a four four game, which this was. But uh, they don't, and instead, um, you know, Pete Ladd loses his control. He walks in the winning run, and the Cardinals are off the hook. You know, the Brewers are still in good shape. They got their road split, but, um, you know, kind of a, a disappointing, you know, ending to that one. So um, so we're, we're back to Milwaukee now, and, um, and this, this Friday night game three, this is the one that, like, this is the World Series game I was able to attend. You know, my dad's uh, business had been able to, uh, you know, get in the lottery for tickets and came back with game three. And we're out there, great atmosphere. Unfortunately, the game itself didn't cooperate all that much. This was the night of Willie McGee, the name uh, Cardinal fans certainly remember with fondness. Um, a t- typical Cardinal player in that he was fast with no power, except the fact he takes Vukovic deep twice. To, you know, yeah. in this game, Andy, Rob, Gorman, Thomas of a home run on top of it, you know, later on. And, and Joaquin Andujar is on the mound. He's brilliant. Uh, Cardinals win six to two. Then the Cardinals come out the following day. Again, to illustrate how different the era is, World Series games are actually played in the afternoon on the weekends. So they, they came back on Saturday, not only played in the day, but at 1 p.m. Eastern, no less. So this right. is a very early start for, compared to what we're used to now. And the Cardinals are ahead 5-1 to one in the seventh inning. And just like I said, it was over in game two. Well, now if you're a casual observer, it's over the other way. The Cardinals are up 2-1. to one. They've guaranteed themselves going back home, and they're ready to put a stranglehold on the series. And the Brewer offense is dead. And they, were t- they had trouble. 
Yep. And, and Dave LaPointe, one of the pitchers given up in the trade is on the mound. And um, then a simple ground ball is hit to first base. I think it was Gorman who hit it, but um, you know, Keith Hernandez, the Cardinals, you know, great defensive first base, but he feels it. He flips it to LaPointe and it hits LaPointe's glove and just drops onto the ground error. And suddenly the floodgates just opened. It was like, just that was the, the spark the Brewers needed. You know, they start, they bat around. It literally comes up to Gorman Thomas again, and they pull, pulled even at 5-5, and, uh, and he gets a two-run single, and they win that game 7-5. to five. And now it's just, it's amazing, you know, when I look back on this series. Like, this, the series didn't have any one of those, like, defining moments like Kirk Gibson's walk-off or Bill Buckner's error or Don Denkinger's blown call, other things that would happen in the 1980s. But when you look at the plot twists and turns that take place in the series, we're only through four games. It's two to two. And it feels like both teams have already had reason to feel like they've kicked the whole thing away. You know, it's just an unbelievable series with the way it's going. And um, then we, um, you know, we turn it over to Caldwell in game five. Not as sharp as he was uh, the first time, but, you know, if you had to talk about guts, this is the game where Mike Caldwell shows it. Even though he gives up 14 hits, he goes eight and a third is holding on to a 6-4 to four lead, and we're able to close it out for him. And I still remember reading the headline, the, the Milwaukee Sentinel, the morning paper back in those days. You just, it showed up on your doorstep Monday morning, and it just said, one more to go. Right. And um, so, Mike, if you can kind of recap how you're feeling right now as, you know, we, they go into, it'll be a travel day on Monday, and then they'll resume play again on Tuesday. How, how are you feeling right now as a fan? <laughs> Well, I mean, you only need one or two, right? I mean, yep. so the idea is is that if you don't if you don't win the first one, you win the second one and it's over with. It's it's you know, the the odds are still in your favor. You're up 3-2. Um again, you allude to it though is is that this series has gone back and forth. There's been a lot of twists and turns. You win 10 nothing the first game, you think things are going really well. It just uh it was it was a little gut-wrenching, but I think the the fact that you're up three to two uh, certainly makes you think that it's it's going to end in your favor, and and the Brewers' bats were just waiting to come alive at that point, and and hopefully have uh, a, a good game in one of these next two next two games, and obviously it didn't go that way, but yeah, that's right, because um you know like I was feeling really good about Tuesday night especially because we've got Don Sutton pitching again. And you're thinking, well, no way are they yes. gonna, is he going to like you know right and he 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 had come through for him obviously to this point and a huge huge deal for them. So I I agree with you. I think when you got Don Sutton coming in, you you think maybe that game is is for yours for you to take. Yeah, that's right. Now one person who maybe knew better was um, our math teacher, Mrs. Murray, who said in the classroom, she said, "There's no way they're winning today. They like to push everything all the way to the very end, no matter what." <laughs> so, and, um, and and that's what would happen. Sutton, it, it, it was just a really strange night. Uh, there was rain coming in, so like the game didn't actually end till the wee hours of the morning, and we were frankly all in bed because Sutton didn't have it. It was a blowout from the get go, right? And, 13 to one would have been the final. So it's so, but we're still, we're going to game seven. We've got Vukovic on the mound. It's a, you know, got the Cy Young award winner on the mound. Still every reason to think you're going to get this done. And the early part of the game, you know, it doesn't go great. It's kind of vintage Vukovic. He's given up singles all over the place. And then getting that key out that gets him out of trouble. The Cardinals have scraped a run across, but we're still right there. And then, and then Ogilvy comes up and just rips one over the right field wall. It's like, okay. I mean, the Cardinals have been like dominating four innings, but it's one, one. Yep. And then we, we get something going in the sixth, you know, Molitor, you know, to, to your point about him being the igniter and having Charlie hustle in it, you shows right here, he beats out a bunt and then and Joaquin Andujar, like in desperation, trying to get him throws it away. So you get, right. you, know, you get everything rolling. The Brewers get a couple of runs and now it's time to get pumped. You're up three to one. You're into the sixth inning. And once again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to harp on this point, but Raleigh is not looming, you know, and that's, you know, again, yeah. and that's the thing that just it kills hurts. you. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, Vukovic starts to, you know, show some cracks. Uh, you know, they try some relievers. I remember Bob McClure was Bob out there McClure. on the mound. Yep. yep. But, um, but they, give up, they give up three runs in that sixth. And the Cardinals do have their closer in the bullpen. They have Suter. And by the yep. seventh inning, he's on the mound. And really, that's the ball game. I mean, there's no more threats the rest of the way. The Cardinals are able to tack on a couple insurance runs. Right. And it ends six to three. And, um, 
it, it still sucks for. just kind of looking back on it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> As a 12-year-old kid, that there's nothing more that hurts than having your favorite team get all the way there and go to a seventh oh. game and then lose it. That was that was heartbreaking. Yeah, it was. It was just everybody was just very down at school the next day. You know, just um, it's just really hard to take. But um, but having said that, like you know, one of the things that this this will still surprise people, like especially from out here in Boston, you know, like when I tell this story, is that when the Brewers' plane got back into Milwaukee that night. There was a yep. huge throng of fans waiting for them and cheering and going nuts, basically thanking them for the season. Yep. The next day, they had a rally at County Stadium that was packed. You know, and Robin Young came riding on his motorcycle. and It was just an extraordinary moment. You know, I said that, you know, to my wife here, who's grown up her entire life in New England. And she's like, wow, out here, out here people would have said, like, yeah, thanks for nothing. <laughs> and, you, know, just moved on. you know, New Englanders are a little more disgruntled. But, um, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, that, was, that was pretty incredible to have a, the losing team actually throw a kind of a ticker tape parade for, yeah. for a team that had obviously uh, lost the World Series instead of winning it. And I, I remember my dad taking me to the two county stadium i actually oh. never went to school that day really I don't, and uh and was I don't remember in, that That's and was inside the inside the stadium and actually if you take a look at a picture of robin yount riding around in his motorcycle there is a picture of me and my brother and my dad and we are actually wow. behind robin yount on the motorcycle that is amazing. Oh, what a story that is. Wow. So, yeah, we, we went. Um, it, you know, it wasn't like they had filled 50,000 people into the stadium. There were probably maybe 10,000 or so inside the stadium, but obviously okay. there were a lot of people on Wisconsin Avenue in Milwaukee that okay. also wow. was lined up along that parade route. They obviously took them from, you know, the downtown uh, Milwaukee to County Stadium and then they rolled into the stadium kind of similar to the way uh you know the Packers did in in 97 when they won the won the Super Bowl but yeah um yeah we waited inside that stadium for the Brewers to show up and then had Robin Yount ride around on his motorcycle and 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 we were there we were in the first row of uh of the box seats on the third base side and and it was uh it's pretty cool to see my picture in the uh in the yearbook uh, the following year. <laughs> that's fantastic. Wow. I didn't know that. That is, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. That's yeah. And it's just, and, and I think that kind of illustrates more than anything. Like what I hope like people that didn't grow up around Milwaukee around the time will take away is just how much love there was between we were fans. the players yeah. and, and the city. I mean, like it wasn't, you know, fake or anything like that, you know, it, and it wasn't just based on whether or not you win. Like they really, you know, love them. And that, you know, and that team is still just very much the heart, you know, of Milwaukee. Regrettably, you know, uh, the franchise has never, you know, gotten that World Series title, you know, yet or anything. You know, fortunately, the, the overall sports landscape that Mike described has lifted considerably. You know, the Packers are consistently a winner right. now. Wisconsin's become pretty good in, in both yep. sports. And, um, but this is, it's pretty close to the end for the Brewers. You know, we didn't really know it at the time. And they were in first place as late as August of 1983. But um, uh, faded pretty hard in September. You know, still ended up um, 87 and 75 was the final record that year. So they're still pretty good. But that is the one team out of the six years window from 78 to 83 that would not have made the playoffs by the standards of today. So, um, you know, this team would have made the playoffs five out of six years, and then 83 would have just missed based on, on that standard. So, um, and Harvey Keene was fired at the end of the year. They brought in Renee Latchman. And the process of the team kind of, you know, of course, as we know, fingers doesn't make it back. And, yeah. um, but the big thing that happens in 1983, and I think this is a great way to cap off uh, our discussion of the era, is that uh, Gorman Thomas is traded. He is traded right. to Texas uh, for Rick Manning, who's uh, or I think it might have been Cleveland. I forget. Cleveland. Cleveland. You're Cleveland. right. Yeah. And um, yeah, and Rick Manning's a good ball player. He's a good defensive center fielder. In purely baseball terms, you know, you can you can justify the move, but it's like as much as anyone, Gorman Thomas epitomizes the blue collar mindset of Milwaukee. And you 100%. know, Mike, tell us about Gorman. 
Yeah. So, you know, Gorman was kind of that, he had that, that, that size and that girth to him. Uh, he hit a lot of home <laughs> runs. He would, he, you would either, you would either see Gorman Thomas hit a home run, strike out four times, or he'd run into the center field wall, making a, a spectacular <laughs> catch. Right. I mean, he, he was, he was blue collar through and through, uh, always loved to, you know, his antics were always having beers after the game with the guys and playing cards. And, and, uh, always, I remember him coming out of the stadium afterwards and signing autographs and certainly a, a real friendly, uh, fan friendly player still is to this day. I've, I've seen him around the, the Brookfield area from time to time. And, and, uh, yeah, you, you loved Gorman Thomas. I mean, you loved his effort. Um, he didn't always hit a lot of uh, base hits. Uh, like I said, he either struck out or hit a home run, but he was fun to watch. He was, yeah. I know a lot of sabermetrics types probably wouldn't, couldn't have stand him. Like they wouldn't have a lot of players today, you know, because he wouldn't <laughs> have those metrics. Some of those metrics weren't there. But you mentioned about the things you could always count on to do. He even said, like, fans come to see me hit a home run, strike out, or run into a wall. I try to give them at least one. You know, that's <laughs> and, he, and he was and he was good at all three of them. I mean, he, right. he really <laughs> he really did well at at all three aspects of it. Yeah. Well, hey, Mike, thanks for being on with me here today, talking about this era, you know, giving us some time here on this Easter weekend here. You know, Mike's got a packed house today with his five girls. So, you know, we were able to hopefully rescue him a little bit and uh, have him talk some sports with us for a while. But um, thanks for being here. I know this is an era that's dear to your heart, to mine, to everybody that grew up in the state of Wisconsin during that time. Uh, uh, oh, my pleasure. This was a lot of fun. It's really great to to go through all these uh, these memories and, and, and relive them. So it's it's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely.